Imagine getting a promotional check in the mail. You know it's not real, but have you ever wondered what would happen if you tried to cash it? All of us who throw those things away, however, are left to wonder at one enterprising young man who did not. Though the check for $95,093.35 was marked not negotiable. One man's attempt to teach his bank some manners. All right, it's showtime. Let's go. I'll show you this. If I drink all night from this ball of jack, is it gonna take the pain away? If I smoke all day like a stoner, is it really gonna put me in a haze? If the truth is what I really feel, then all I wanna say, promise me one thing, one thing, please let the music play. If I go to the church and I pray all day, would it make me a holy saint? If I sleep for the night and I don't wake up, will my dreams be here to stay? If the truth is what I really feel, then all I want to say, promise me one thing, one thing, please let the music play. Let the music play! So this patient is in dire need of a heart transplant. When his surgeon walks in the room and says, fortunately, I've just located you two hearts, but you have to choose between the two of them. The patient goes, okay, doctor, what do you got? Well, the first heart I located you is from a young athlete. He's fantastically fit. As a matter of fact, he once won the Ironman competition, but tragically, he just died in a biking accident. The second heart I found you is from an old fat banker. He smoked and he drank his whole life and he just died of high blood pressure and diabetes. But like I said, you need to choose between the two of them because they cost different amounts. Well, how much, doctor? Well, the young athlete's heart would set you back $5,000. The old banker's heart would cost you 10 grand. Doctor, I'm so confused why the old banker's heart would cost twice as much as the young athlete's. Because the banker's heart has never been used. <laughs> what do you think? I, that's not my joke. It's not my joke. As a matter of fact, though, that is a joke that somebody emailed to me about six months into this whole escapade that I'm going to relate to you tonight. But I've gotten way ahead of the story. We need to start at the very beginning, which is the fact that I bank at First Interstate, which is one of the largest banks in the world. And it's been my only bank forever. And I love my bank. And I'll tell you why I love my bank. Because my bank is the only bank in the world that I'm aware of that offers the $5 perfect service guarantee. Now get a load of what this means, that if the bank were to make a mistake ever, all you have to do is walk into the bank, tell the teller about the mistake, and in theory, they will just give you $5 cash right there on the spot is their way of saying that they're sorry. Huh, that sounds cool, but I've never experienced it for myself. Until one day I walk up to these two ATM machines outside my bank, they're side by side on the wall. I wait for a long time to use this one, and when I finally get up and it's my turn, they shut the ATM machine off for refreshing. Now, I could slide over and use this one, but suddenly, this strikes me as not perfect service. <laughs> so, I see if it works. So, I go into the bank, and I walk up to my favorite teller, which is this gorgeous redhead, and I go, Hi, um, I had to come in to do my banking today because they were refreshing the ATM machine, which technically isn't perfect service, but I doubt you'd give me $5 for that, would you? And she's like, Mr. Combs, I am so sorry about that inconvenience. Truly, I am. So sure. And she hands me a $5 bill. And from that point in time, I hunt for broken ATM machines. <laughs> Now, this whole story that I'm telling you tonight takes place while I'm living in San Francisco, California. I brought photographs to document it. For instance, that's my home, and this is my piece of shit car. <laughs> it's the 1977 Ford Gramama. That's what my neighbors call it. Now, at the time that this thing really gets started, there's a little fun fact. I have a little bit of credit card debt when this thing arrives in the mail. I have $45,000 of credit card debt. True story. But the reason why we're all gathered here, right, is because I do go to my mailbox and I find this inside. 
and look, it says that there's $95,093.35 enclosed. And it looks like there's a check inside made payable to moi. Wow, that's exciting. Except for the fact that I know in advance what this is. We get them all the time. This is a junk mail check. But I'm in this little habit of opening it up and just looking and reading the letter for fun because often they're fun. And this is what I find inside this letter. This is a get rich quick scheme. Yeah, so he's trying to sell me this $150 system that will make me get rich quick. And look, he says it right here. He says, one of my new locators made $95,000 on his first try. Patrick Combs, put yourself in that picture. So I did. <laughs> but look at the check. This one is particularly fun because this one says that it's from the treasurer's office. That's a nice touch. It, that's my actual street address. Bank account numbers. Wow, those aren't always there. Signed by somebody who's authorized to give me how much? $95,093.35. My troubles are over. Oh, sheet. That's the buzzkill right there. Not negotiable. Okay, now, it's very important for the purpose of the show that everybody understands what not negotiable means, okay? Or someone gets left behind, <laughs> all right? So, does everybody understand what not negotiable means? Okay, I'm gonna just be really clear in case you don't know. What that means is that you cannot take this check into your bank and try and negotiate for more money. They will just say, no, it's 95,000, take it or leave it. <laughs> That's really going to F with somebody who didn't know what not negotiable means. No, okay, but listen, all right, truth, we all know, that means this is not worth the piece of paper that it's printed on. That is the equivalent of monopoly money right there. That is the equivalent of monopoly money. And what would be better to do with monopoly money made payable to me than to deposit it into my ATM machine as a joke on the bank? <laughs> Oh, you guys got pretty quiet on that one. <laughs> Are you scared? Don't be scared. Come on, if putting Monopoly money into the ATM machine isn't banker humor, what is? <laughs> I love the idea. I decide that I will just cheer up some banker with this little fun fact. And so I go down to my ATM machine, sir, and I punch in my PIN number. You could look away while I'm punching in my PIN number. That would be nice. And then it's, oh, what am I doing? I am doing a deposit into my checking account. For how much? <laughs> Just another day at the ATM machine for me. $95,093.35. Wow, that was fun in and of itself. <laughs> oh, right, that's right, I have to endorse it. So I do, I endorse the back of the check with this. <laughs> You should know that is not my legal signature, <laughs> okay? Now, how many people think that that makes this obviously a joke? How many people makes that clear? <laughs> See, so did I, so did I. And then right here, I re the wheels start scrolling, and I'm like, oh, come on, what were you thinking, Patrick? This is a million dollar piece of equipment. Highly sophisticated technology, it's gonna take your check, it's got a sensor inside, it's gonna spit it back out and just be like, bullshit. <laughs> Okay, but I'm down here, I did my artwork, so I put it near the wheels, and it just sucks it right out of my hand. I turn to the guy behind me, and I'm like, the ATM machine just took Monopoly money. I'm fake rich. Yay! And for the first time ever, I walked away from my bank laughing. Now, we have been speaking for four minutes, okay? In the last four minutes, everything I've told you is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And that will be the standard for the rest of our evening together. And I will not be exaggerating either. Ask me why. why? There will be no need. <laughs> I put that check in, factually speaking, as a joke on Friday, May 19th. If you need to know, I had an excellent time with my buddies over the weekend. And then on Monday, I realized like, I am so out of macaroni and cheese. And so back down to my ATM machine, I went, just hoping that 
there might be some kind of money in my bank account to retrieve. So I punch in my PIN number, I ask for 40 bucks, it spits out with 40 bucks, it gives me back my ATM card, and then I start to depart and I see it out of the corner of my eye. I didn't ask for it, I don't want it, I don't wanna know my bank account balance, my bank account balance depressed, <laughs> holy shit! <laughs> My bank account balance is suddenly exciting! The little fake check that could! And I break into a run for home. And I run all the way home, even though I had driven. As soon as I'm home, I pick up the phone and I call my buddy Scott because his mother works in banking and I'm desperately wondering what in the world is going on here. I ask him for an explanation, he gives me one. Believe it or not, this is not a mistake. That is standard banking practice. Yeah. So it turns out that a bank will accept anything that you deposit in the ATM machine and then they'll credit your account like it looks like you have the money, but the trick is you can't go get that money out in cash until your check clears. And Scott is like, my perfectly ridiculous fake check is gonna bounce in two to three days, five days max. My bank account will be back to embarrassing. So that's a bummer, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> but all is not lost because now I have a new hobby. Anybody? <laughs> Checking my bank account balance. That's right. Listen, I'm calling the automated line, right, in real life. It's a pre recorded woman's voice, but I, I gotta tell you, now that she's telling me I have a six figure bank account balance, <laughs> Dude, it's like phone sex. <laughs> really? The money's still in my account? What are you wearing? It's still in my account. Who's your daddy now? It's still in my account. Oh, you know how I like it. <laughs> Hold on. Darling, you're telling me the money is still in my account? Quick, quick, quick. How long did Scott say that uh, it would bounce? How long? How long? Five max, right? One, two, three, four, five. Does that mean that I could get this money out in cash? There'd only be one way to find out. This is an actual photograph of my bank where I'm doing all these shenanigans. <laughs> now I walk in and I wait for that, my favorite teller, the redhead, because she gave me $5 last time. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm thinking of buying a house this afternoon. If I needed, say, um, I, I don't know, $90,000 of cash, I'm, I, I couldn't get that, could I? Oh, let me look that up for you, Mr. Combs. Yes, you could. Would you like it? <laughs> Truth be told, no, I, I would not like it. That, that feels to me like really dangerous money, like go to jail money, and I just leave that money sitting in the bank, and I go back to my new recreation, calling to see if the money is still in the account. Saturday it is. Sunday, I thought it would be. Monday, I'm accruing interest! <laughs> And it's happening faster than I ever imagined. Holy smokes, this is getting seriously fun. Now, Tuesday, I call to tell you, I'm calling more often every day. <laughs> Wednesday, more often. Thursday, Friday. By Friday, I am calling so often for my bank account balance, it is best described like this. <laughs> I can't stop calling for my bank account balance. <laughs> I'm like Smeagol in Lord of the Rings. Smeagol must keep the precious. 
I am skipping meals and work and baths to check on my bank account. I've got it on speed dial, speed dial, speed dial, speed dial. I used to date real women. I'm just jerking my own chain here, right? Right? This is a $100,000 mistake, isn't it? And they're going to catch up with it. Yeah. And when they do, I got to give the money back. And in the meantime, I've got no life. No mac and cheese. And this is when I realize what I have to do. I have to walk into that bank and I have to tell them what I've done. I have to confess. I'm a little... You know, the branch manager, he's going to look it up on his computer right when I tell him. He's going to be like, oh, Mr. Combs, we did make a mistake. Here's your five dollars. That's the branch manager right there. You can tell because he wears a bow tie. He's got these little John Lennon wireframe glasses. Hi, sir. Oh, yeah, it's a beautiful day outside. But listen, I got to cut to the chase here. Um, I came in to confess something. Oh, that um, I recently deposited a check for about um, $95,000. And... I wanted to um, confess that uh, I was wondering if you could tell me when I'd be safe to start spending it. <laughs> yeah. That's the shit that came out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't do it when it came right down to it. And yet I totally regret, totally regret saying those words. I do not understand why I walked into a bank and called attention to the biggest financial break I'm most certainly ever going to get in my life. But you know what? It's too late because the branch manager is suddenly very interested in my account. He's like, Mr. Combs, are you referring to the deposit on May 19th for $95,093.35? Mr. Combs, don't move. <laughs> Very interesting. Mr. Combs, I need to legally inform you that checks cannot come back after 10 business days, so you're safe to start spending this money because you're protected by the law. And you know what? I actually didn't touch that money. I still left it sitting in that bank. But what I did touch, my friends, is every single brochure that that bank had laying around on the counters because I just want to read that 10-day law for myself. I figured that if I can confirm the 10-day law for myself, then I'll be good to go here on spending this money. And I find in the brochure stack the perfect brochure because it's actually titled Your Banking Rights. Okay, so what's this 10-day law, my right thing? Um, we may, uh, no, you agree to? No, I didn't, but uh, you have, uh, you agree, we may, the law permits us to, the law lets us, you are responsible. <laughs> I beg you, if you take anything away from tonight, read your banking brochures. I swear to you, there is not a single customer right in this entire brochure. And I'm scratching my head thinking, why didn't you title the brochure, what the F made you think you had rights? <laughs> But I have got to read you verbatim my favorite line that I found in this brochure. <clears throat> Our statements and notices are in English. If you can't read English, please call us at this number. <laughs> 
For more information about bank check law, call the Office of Thrift Supervision. Does anybody know what that is? What does where I buy my clothes have to do with this? <laughs> I dial 411 for San Francisco and I get a telephone number for some Office of Thrift Supervision right there in San Francisco. Now this guy answers the telephone and I confess every single thing about my situation just so that I can pop this question. Sir, can we cut to the chase here now? Can you confirm uh, what my branch manager said about the 10 day law making me safe to start spending this money? My branch manager was wrong. There's no such thing as a 10 day law. Really, it's a 24 hour law? <laughs> my friends, he says it's known as the midnight deadline that banks have by midnight of the following day to tell us that that check we deposited bounced or we are safe to start spending that money. Do you promise? <laughs> what? The nine criteria of a negotiable instrument? What is that? Okay, hold on. I want to tell my friends. Okay, track this really closely, okay? <laughs> um, he, said, he thinks something different is going on. He's got a different theory about what's going on here. Listen, he says that a check, in order to be real, a valid with the law, has to match this nine legal criteria. The nine criteria of a negotiable instrument. But he says uh, that my check may have been designed to look so real that it accidentally matched the nine criteria <laughs> and hence was a real check. What are the nine criteria? <laughs> you don't know. Well, I thought you might based on where you work. No. Okay, where would I find these? Where else would I find them? No, there's got to be another place. There's got to be another way, sir. Please don't tell me that's so. That's the only way. Damn it. I'd have to go to a library. <laughs> but I do. I go to my first law library ever. I find it in downtown San Francisco, just across from City Hall. It's called the Hastings Law Library. It's red brick with charcoal smoke glass. Now, has anybody here ever been in a law library? Raise your hands. I'm so sorry. <laughs> But these people will testify what I'm about to tell you. Don't go in here. There is not a single picture in any of those books. <laughs> now, I'm hunting through this like torturous maze, you know, of knowledge. And the longer I look, the more I realize that I'm in trouble because I went to a state school. <laughs> and I feel like I'm never going to find the book that he told. Brady on Bank Checks, the definitive book of bank check law by Richard Hagedorn and <sighs> Henry Bailey. Popular book. Okay, so we need the um, midnight deadline or the nine criteria of a negotiable instrument or for all I care, the 10 day law. Oh my God, this is going to be really tough, tougher than I thought it was going to be because how do I say this? Oh, oh, at the Del Mar Fair, right? Have you, have you guys seen that guy? He will write your entire first and last name on a single grain of rice. Have you seen that? He's the same publisher. It's so small. I'm like, I'm trying to decipher this book, right, man? And I'm just like, oh my God, like it might be in a totally different Latin. It might be in Latin, you know? And it's like, I, I literally can't read it. And I'm like, oh, and then I have a breakthrough because I realize, like, oh, it was just upside down. <laughs> so I'm looking through this book, right? And I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm looking. And 20 minutes later, all I'm trying to find in this 3,000 page book, I swear to you, is the table of contents. I cannot find the table of contents. You want to hear why? It would take me a year to learn. Because it turns out the table of contents is a separate fucking book. <laughs> why? Why do these two jerks have to make a book that nobody can read? Because I sit with the book for an hour and I can't make sense of it. My SAT scores are too low. <laughs> and I give up. 
I give up. And I had $100,000 riding on this thing. And I'm leaving the library and I see it. Was I meant to see it? It's a little pocket-sized book with a colorful cover, the kind that we used to read at San Francisco State. <laughs> it's face out on the shelf and it's titled Negotiable Instruments and Check Collection in a nutshell. <laughs> I flip open the book randomly to the middle, but I'm looking down at a page that says the nine criteria of a negotiable instrument. It must say pay to the order of cha-ching. It must have an exact dollar amount, cha-ching. It must have a signature, cha-ching. It must have a date, cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. Oh my God, my check did match. All nine of the legal criteria, my check said not negotiable across the top right hand corner what am I thinking I flip the page in the little book and I see a headline that says negotiability or not by declaration is there a lawyer in the house <laughs> I'm not a lawyer but that sounds a lot like our situation doesn't it so I read like I've never read before and I find this paragraph up here that says the opposite issue is when you write not negotiable, is the instrument still valid? Oh God, I cover up that answer before I can see it. <laughs> do you do that too? Who does that too? Put your hands up. Oh yeah, I always do that, right? I got, I, I got to get ready to know when, when it really matters, you know? <laughs> Whew, so I get ready. We probably don't talk enough. <laughs> but do you realize what is at stake here, God? Almost $100,000. Please, God, I am so tired of being $45,000 in credit card debt, my man. Please give me the answer, yes. Y-E-S. Just three letters. I'm sure you can give me a Y-E-S, God. God, if you will give me a, a, the answer, yes, I will be good. No, I will cut you in. <laughs> you like 10%, right? Ten <laughs> percent of this money for you, God. If this goes our way. <laughs> All right, will you read this out loud with me, my friends, please? The Oh, wow, three people who are going to get a cut. <laughs> Answer. <laughs> wow, the rest of you are suck-ups. <laughs> I like it. Good. All together so I'm not in alone. The, the answer is, is, what do we need? Yes. Read it. The answer is yes, my friends. Read. No. Oh. Oh. Jesus. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so the problem is I'm telling you a completely true story. And that's what happened in the library. I came that close to thinking this money was legally mine. And then I looked down at my finger, and I'd moved it just a smidgen. And that's when I saw it. Come what? We're back in the game! All right, you're an excellent negotiator. I got to hand that to you. <laughs> I hear you loud and clear, God. Half of this money for you. 50% of this money for you, God. Think of the things you could do with that. Please. Here we go, my friends. On three. One. From the top. Two. Three. The. Yeah answer is don't read so fast you're freaking me out the answer is no come except so I was doing the show in London right 
serious, I was doing it in London, Ted was in the audience and stuff, and for the first time ever, this guy in the, like, in the back, he yells out, except on Christmas. <laughs> I was like, oh, Tiny Tim's in attendance. <laughs> okay, I'm just stalling here. This could be worth $100,000. Here we go. Except, except on, on You got to read it for me, my friends. Check. What? Oh, look, a declaration on a check that it's not negotiable isn't effective. Oh, 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 God, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, my God. I'm rich from a junk mail check. It came as a junk mail check, and I'm rich from a junk mail check. Oh, 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 my man, my beloved man, you will get your 5%. Okay, check this out, my friends. According to the Wall Street Journal, the junk mail king who mailed out these accidentally real $95,000 checks mailed out over 40 million of them to North America, 40 million. You don't get it. <laughs> what did you do with yours? <laughs> neener, neener, neener. <laughs> no, just kidding. Woo! Celebrate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As soon as I'm home, the first person that I decide to call is my mother. Now, here's what you need to know. We grew up really poor. My mom's a single mom. She raised us in a trailer house. And $95,000 is seriously like almost an entire generation of income for us. So I phone her up. I tell my mom everything. And verbatim, my mom goes, oh, son, for $95,000, they'll kill you. <laughs> Where does my mom bank? <laughs> it's like she banks in Mexico or something. Okay, note to self, I must get my mom a new bank. But not until I call my brother, Mike. He's my older brother. He lives out in Boston. Mike is a suit and tie guy. He's very conservative. He works for IBM. And he's not going to like this at all. Like, he's always asking me, when am I going to grow up? But the one thing that you can count on about my older brother is he will always tell you the grown-up, mature, you know, conservative, safe thing to do. So I figure it wouldn't hurt to at least consider that, not that I'll do it. So I phone him up and I tell him everything. And my bro goes, let me see if I have this straight. <laughs> you put a $95,000 junk mail check into your bank as a joke? Are we related? <laughs> no. Before I tell you what I do, I'm going to tell you what I think. Oh, I knew this was coming. I think whoever's missing this money, legally yours or not, is going to come for it at night. Yeah, yeah, bro, you're right, you're right, you're right. What was I thinking? You're right. So, um, so you do what, bro? I'd get it in cash. 
You just heard that, right? You just heard that, right? Oh my God, that's a bonding moment with me and my brother. So I ask him, why would you get it in cash, bro? Because then you have control over the money, Patrick, and this junk mail king can't just phone up the bank and tell him some BS story and have the money just electronically removed from your account. No, he'll have to phone you up and ask you back for the money nicely. What do you think of these people that run these get-rich-quick schemes? Um, I think that they're, uh, they're, they're liars and they're deceitful and they're probably cutting down forcefuls of trees to mail out all this junk mail and they're, they're probably taking the life savings of elderly. I mean, they're a good candidate, right, for scum of the earth. Although, bro, I have to admit they've been very good to me. <laughs> Never mind. Get the money in cash and lock it in a safe deposit box at your bank. Oh, because, little brother, the money will be safe there, first of all. But secondly, I don't know if you know this, but when you have a safe deposit box, the bank actually gives you a privacy area that you can go to. Imagine, you could just go there and you could be alone with all that money. <laughs> you could just smell it and hold it and fondle it. And I'm like, Mike, money makes you horny, bro. And I like the idea. So I begin investigating getting this money all out in cash. But truth be told, I do my investigations at other banks around San Francisco just to be safe. And I learned something I did not know. If you get more than $10,000 of cash out of the bank at the same time, first of all, they're going to tell the IRS the same day. And secondly, a lot of times you're going to order that money to be delivered to the car in an armored bank and you have to pay the fee on the armored car. But I learned that if you get a cashier's check, which is as good as gold anywhere on planet Earth. Those two things don't happen. So I'm wondering if I could get a cashier's check for all this money. And I want to try. I, I don't want to do this, though, where I normally bank in the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood. <coughs> a lot of you have been to the Haight-Ashbury, right? <laughs> yeah, this is a dirty, filthy, nasty, disgusting neighborhood. It worked fine for me when I was poor. <laughs> Here's the thing, to be sincere, I don't know why, but I guess just once in my life, I want to bank where the rich people bank. It's not in the Haight-Ashbury, it's downtown among the skyscrapers. This thing is like the height of the Roman Empire. Huge arch marble cathedral ceilings. Marched co marble columns coming down everywhere. Giant oil paintings of clipper shit. Marble countertops to fill out your deposit slips. And gold pens to do it with. And my favorite part, ma'am, they're not chained down. All right. <laughs> and security cameras all over the bank. I had not thought of security cameras. I need to just go. <laughs> Hi, sir. <laughs> I'd like to uh, get a cashier's check, please, for... Um $95,093.35. Uh, and jeez uh, Louise, is it just me or could you guys turn down the heat in here? <laughs> and just like that, he says it's okay. And he makes out a cashier's check for all that money. <laughs> of course, Mr. Combs, because of the unusually high dollar amount on this particular item, I'll just need to clear it with the branch manager first. And off he goes, and Jesus, before I can, like, find an exit and run, the branch manager is looking at me, and she's examining me, and she's typing numbers on her computer. And I just want to get out of here now, because I shouldn't really have done this. I'm way in over my... And she's walking back over to me. She's got the cashier's check. She sets it on the countertop. I go to grab it. I'm going to get out of the 
oh shit, in one of the worst moments of my entire life, she is not letting go of the check. <laughs> what do you intend to do with this money when you walk out of those doors? Oh geez, I, 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 I don't know, I'm sorry, I'm so, I'm so sorry, I, I don't have a plan. <laughs> oh, that's okay, we have excellent investment counselors who can help you decide. Oh, I understand now. Uh, no, thank you, ma'am. You know, uh, I'd just like to open a safe deposit box. Here at the bank, please. And I do, I open a safe deposit box. And I lock my cashier's check into the safe deposit box. And as a result, I walk out of that bank with two things. This, the proof of purchase for all of that money. What would my brother do <laughs> besides, like, lick the key? <laughs> Let's go ultra conservative on this. You tracking this? Leave that money locked in that safe deposit box for one year. We can do it. If after one year nobody's come to claim that money, we'll know that nobody's ever coming to claim that money, that it just slipped through some rich person's crack. Okay, I was talking about a different crack, but if that's, <laughs> if that's where rich people put their money, fine with me. So, I begin waiting. One. Hold on, my friends. This is why it's a two-hour show. <laughs> oh, have you know about me? I am the most patient man you've ever met. I have the patience of a saint, iron will for waiting. So I waited that thing out for 48 hours, and then I collapsed. <laughs> I couldn't wait another day. I've got $100,000 here that I could start spending, and I've got a telephone right there that now terrifies me every time it rings, because I'm thinking, who in the world's calling, and, and, and what's going to be said, and what's the, when the junk mail... Okay, the junk mail king's name is Mitch Claus, like Santa. <laughs> and his phone number's in the letter. So hypothetically, we could call him right now, and we could uh, tell him what we've done, and that forces the issue and ends the waiting. It's like an ambush. How many people in favor say aye? <laughs> Not a single person! <laughs> That's a new record. That's a new record in green eating. Wow, you sons of guns. Is that how hard up we are? Wow. Okay, I totally agree with you in hindsight. I have a question. Where were you when I needed you? Unfortunately, I thought that it was a good idea that it was just like getting a jump on things and, and, and getting my money sooner. So I phoned him up. His office is located in Columbus, Ohio. This gal answers the telephone. Association of Certified Liquidators. How may I help you today, darling? Is Mr. Mitch Claus there? Did you purchase our $149 sales system, son? No, you did not, sugar. Then no, Mr. Claus is not in today. He's out of the country. Would you like to leave a message? He's out of the country. Um, yes, please. Would you tell him that my name is Patrick Combs and I got the $95,000 check that he sent me and I cashed it and I was calling to tell him, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're trying to tell me that you cashed the fake check. Hold for one second, please. I'm going to get Mr. Claus for you. <laughs> Money talks, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, Jesus. I did not make up what I was going to say in advance. I'm about to improvise the most important phone call of my life when she comes back on the phone. Mr. Claus won't take your phone call, darling, but he told me to give you a very important message, and that's to have a nice day. I'm having the best day ever! Holy smokes! 
folks, you heard that, right? Called, we told the man that we've got his money. He wished us well. Oh, forget about it. I feel like the weight of the world has been lifted off of my shoulders, and I can start thinking about what I actually want to spend this money on. And my friends, I have had $45,000 of credit card debt crushing down on me for five years, so there's no sense in paying that off now. <laughs> I'm thinking of a boat, oh, oh, a couple motorcycles, a, a vacation in Mexico where the money is worth three times as much. Oh, okay, a vacation in Boston. Uh, wow, I almost missed it in all this. Uh, I'm flying into my brother's house. My mom flies in. It's an annual thing, you know, we're together for two weeks. And uh, I asked my buddy Scott if he'd drive me down to the airport. But if he'd stop first in an ATM machine. So I get a little cash for my trip. Scott standing here goes, Oh shit, dude, you're going to San Quentin. <laughs> No, Scott, I'm not going to San Quentin. I'm going to Boston. Check my airline. To hey, buddy, chill out, man. No, 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 no. That is not a bad thing. That's a very good thing because that's another $5. <laughs> Oh, on my way to Boston, I have a layover here in Chicago's O'Hare Airport, and I use it to walk up to this bank of pay phones and check my messages back home. Oh, I have three messages now. They're all from a bank security officer. He says it's urgent that I phone him back immediately. God, I wonder what this could be about. <laughs> Hold on one second. Let's call. Hi, is Owen Persons there? I'm sorry, Mr. Persons isn't in today. Would you like to leave a message? Oh, yes, please. Would you tell him that Patrick Combs returned all of his phone calls? Patrick Combs? Hold, please, Mr. Combs. I'm going to put you right through to Mr. Persons. Wow, it's great being rich. I had no idea. My name is Owen Persons, and I'm on the case now. Do you understand? I'm your only point of contact at this bank from this point forward. Are we clear? Now, when you put this piece of BS into your bank, you committed a crime, son. You need to come in right now and give me back that money. Mr. Persons, okay, it's nice to meet you, sir. Hello. Um, I can't come in right now because I'm halfway across the country. I'm, I'm on my way to Boston for a couple of weeks. I hope you're not as stupid as you sound, son. You're going to catch the next flight back to San Francisco right now. And you're going to come in and you're going to give me back that money. Oh, um, well... I can appreciate that you're requesting me to do that, sir, but I can't afford it. Uh, it's, it's ironic, but I have less than $100 in my bank account now, so I can't change my airline ticket. What did you do with all that money? What did I do with it? Um, okay, I, I'll tell you what I did with my money. I got my money in a cashier's check, and then I locked it in a safe deposit box. At First Interstate Bank, as a matter of fact. Are you at First Interstate's downtown branch right now? Because you could be very close to it. <laughs> then you're gonna give me permission to drill open that box. Oh, this is serious to you, isn't it? Okay, you're gonna give me a letter now on official bank stationery stating that you are who you say you are and that you work for the bank. And you go ahead and put whatever you want in the letter, but I require you to add into that letter the reasons why the bank is requesting this money back from me in the first place, because I have to admit to you, I'm a little bit confused on that. Now, once I've gotten this letter, I will review it, and when I'm ready, I'll phone you back, and we'll go from there. What do you think? <laughs> He no likey. <laughs> you think this is a joke? This is not a joke. When you put this piece of shit into your bank, you committed a crime. You committed fraud, son. That's right. F-R... <laughs> fraud. 
which can land you in prison for over a decade. Now you listen to me. I'm not giving you any letter. I don't have to give you any letter. This phone call is all I have to give you. It is all I ever will give you. Unless, of course, you want more from me, son. We playing a game now. How does policeman at your doorstep sound? I'm gonna ask you one more time. Are you gonna give me permission to drill open that box or not? Hold for one second, please, sir. I just wet my pants. <laughs> Hold for one second, please, my friends, because we have got to think this out right now really fast and not make a bad decision. What, in a, um, why, does he, why is he denying me that letter? Is he trying to cover up the truth? Because everybody else said this was legally my money, right? Yeah, but on the other hand, he said that I committed fraud. He can't spell it, I don't think, but he said it, right? <laughs> no, this is not funny because I cannot go to jail for fraud. Not good, not good. Oh, oh, Jesus, Patrick, this is no time to be stupid. Don't be stupid. Just go with what your brother would do. What would Mike do? Uh, Mr. Persons, I'm back. Um, let, sir, um, I'm, I, I have decided that you do, um, you do not have permission to drill. Open that box. God, please stop yelling at me, man. Stop yelling at me. God, I can't think. Um, here's what I'm saying. I'm going to be 3,000 miles away in Boston at my brother's house. You can check my airline tickets on that. So what I'm saying is you give me until July 6th when I land back in San Francisco, and I promise you I will come in that day, and, and I will meet with you on this. If I give you my brother's phone number and my flight numbers, okay, sir, it's a deal. Have a good day. In Boston, I go straight to the Boston College Law Library. Because the whole flight there, I had this really sickening feeling in my stomach that I should never have trusted that little pocket-sized book for squirrels. <laughs> and I refine the definitive book on bank check law, Brady on Bank Checks, by Richard Hagedorn and Henry Bailey. And this time, I have got to find the answer. So I am looking, and I am looking, and I am looking, and I am looking, and I cannot make sense out of your lousy book that apparently you think nobody should be able to read, Mr. Hagedorn. And and Mr. Bailey, Richard Hagedorn is a law professor at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. And Henry Bailey is also a law professor at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. Um, I grew up in Bend, Oregon, so I know where Willamette University is. And suddenly I'm, I'm wondering, what if I could call up and I could reach one of these guys and I could ask them if I committed fraud? Would that not be like having the best lawyer in the country? They wrote the, the monster on it. So I dial up Willamette University's law library and this gal answers the telephone. Is Richard Hagedorn there? He's on sabbatical for six months. Do I want to leave a message? No, ma'am. I'm going to be some prisoner's girlfriend by then. <laughs> wow, and I got a bunch of jerks in Oceanside who think that's funny. <laughs> Is Henry Bailey there? He retired a year ago. A wild guess here, but you know, I'm from Bend, Oregon. It's a retirement community. I'm gonna guess that he retired to Bend, Oregon. He didn't. Uh, where did he s retire to? Providence, Rhode Island. Thank you so much, ma'am. One minute later, directory assistance is giving me a telephone number for one Henry J. Bailey in Providence, Rhode Island. Now the phone rings actually for over 20 times and I almost forget I'm on the phone, but suddenly I hear, who is this? Hi, my name is Patrick. Are you a banker? <laughs> no, sir. I... Then you're a lawyer. Oh, no, sir. That... Then you're some jerk from the press. No, sir. Then what in the hell are you calling me for? Oh, uh, just to ask you, ask you a quick question, sir, and then I'll leave you alone the rest of your life because now I know why you retired. <laughs> sir, um, I put this junk mail check into my bank as a joke and my bank cashed it, but no, 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 sir, just as a joke. Okay, can we debate my sense of humor later? <laughs> 
listen to the facts, man. I put it in on May 19th. My bank cashed it, but didn't tell me anything was wrong with that check until June 22nd, 32 days later. So this money is legally mine, right? Because of the midnight deadline. Oh, I'm on the phone with a legal expert. <laughs> I didn't realize that, excuse me. Good. So you understand that the midnight deadline doesn't start ticking until your bank receives a fax from another bank notifying them that your check bounced. Oh, I'm sorry. You didn't understand that's how the midnight deadline works, did you? That's right. It doesn't start ticking until your bank receives a fax from another bank. And it's not like your bank is ever just gonna hand this fax over to you, give you this smoking gun. So you haven't got anything here, son. Your bank could have received that on June 21st, hence why they notified you on the 22nd, well within their legal limit. So how else may I help you waste time during my retirement? <laughs> no other way, sir. And I bet you just told me that I committed fraud with a junk mail check. What did you do with the money, son? What? Oh. Yes, grandfather. <laughs> I got the money in a cashier's check. I'm so stupid, and I locked it in a safe. You got the money in a cashier's check? Did you get that cashier's check for the exact same amount of money as that junk mail check you deposited? Oh, yes, sir, I did. No! You need to listen to me very carefully. Right down to the penny. Oh, yes, sir, right down to the 35 cents. Why? Because you've got this bank by the balls. <laughs> well, do go on. <laughs> It's called finality of payment. Listen, son, in the history of courts and banks, any time a bank has issued a cashier's check for the exact same amount of money as a check they received on deposit, that court has ruled in your favor every single time for a hundred years. So this money is legally yours. Don't let this bank screw you around. Oh, Mr. Bailey, it was such an honor to talk to you. And I just want to tell you what a great book you wrote, man. <laughs> okay, so this money's legally mine, huh? And that guy says he won't give me a letter? Hmm. All right, so I decide I'm going to phone up that yelling security officer, Owen Persons, and I'm going to give him an ultimatum. But I decide that I'm not going to call him during his office hours because I actually don't want to reach him. <laughs> oh, I don't want him yelling at me anymore, you know? So I phone him up in the middle of the night. I reach his answering machine. Mr. Persons, this is Patrick Combs calling, and I've thought about it, and the bank does, in fact, need to give me that letter, and in that letter, the bank needs to tell the truth about the mistakes that they made here. Mm -hmm. You know, see, the bank needs to be accountable for their mistakes the way we're held to be accountable for our banking mistakes. Now, the way I see it is if the bank can see fit to act decent and honest like that, take some responsibility here, you know what? It was just a joke. I can see myself giving back this $95,000. But on the other hand, and hear me very clearly because it's a very strong hand, sir. If the bank can't see fit to act honest like that and give me that letter of truth, then I cannot see myself giving back this $95,000, which I happen to have learned is legally mine. So here's the deal. Fax the letter to my brother's house in Boston or you're not gonna see this money again. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> so the first person I tell that I stood up for myself is my brother. And my brother goes, you grossly misunderstand banks, Patrick. 
A bank is never going to admit that they made a $95,000 mistake in your favor, write that down as evidence, and hand that over to you. <laughs> oh, yeah, bro? Well, I guess we're just going to see which one of us is right then, aren't we? And really, was there ever any question which one of us was right? <laughs> because it's my bigger brother and he's always right for some reason. And I tell you, I'm waiting in Boston, but no, no, no. The bank does not send me a letter. The bank does not send me a fax. The bank does not phone call me. The bank is just con I got a floor fax machine from Ikea. Check it out, bro. I stood up for myself, and I did get the letter. Really? You bank at First Chicago? That's interesting, because I thought you banked at First Interstate. What? I don't bank at First Chicago. I don't even know First Chicago. And oh, OK, it's about me, non negotiable 95000 But what is this? Oh, here's a name, Michael Bickham, Research Adjustment Processing, and his telephone number. OK. Well, it's somebody to call. So I dial up Michael. And I get him on the phone, and I go, Michael, um, I got this fax in my hand. Can you tell me what it is that I'm looking at? I, I don't really understand it. If I give you the item numbers from the do top of the document? Sure. Tell me. Yes, easy. That's the fax that I sent over to First Interstate Bank, notifying them that this check bounced. Suddenly, I'm remembering the words of Henry J. Bailey. So it's not like your bank is just going to hand over this smoking gun. <laughs> But remember, he also said, my bank could have found out, received this on June 21st, hence why they notified me on the 22nd, well within their legal limit for the midnight deadline. Michael, I've got a serious question to ask you, and this question, if it goes my way, could be worth $100,000 to me. So uh, if it goes my way, I'm a very generous guy, and I'll send you a fruit basket. When did you fax this to my bank, bro? Because if you fax it any sooner than June 21st, I'm a rich man. And it's at that point in the conversation when Michael realizes I don't work at the bank. And he's like, no, 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 I'm not allowed to give that information out over the phone. But I can tell you it's written on the memo. Good luck. <laughs> his midnight deadline, not by one day, but by 16 days, and then fax me the smoking gun. <laughs> Put your hands together. That's customer service. Are we all clear on what just happened here? Oh, yes, I can walk this into any court in the land and go, your honor, right here, Proof that for 16 days, somebody at my bank was smoking crack. <laughs> oh, we got the bank by the balls and the bat, if you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, okay. Now here, this, this is my guess. But who in their right mind would fax me the smoking gun from First Interstate Bank? So look at the top of the document. It says FIB security. So I believe that Owen Persons, the security officer, in that big brain of his went, this punk wants me to prove his check bounced here. Zzz. <laughs> oh, we're going to have to give him $5 for that. <laughs> OK, so you know what? All three laws are in my favor. All three laws legally grant me this money. Now, my mother tried to raise my brother and I to be good, decent human beings. So call me crazy, but I'm going to give this bank one more chance to do the right thing. Here's how I see it. I cannot get over the fact that that bank said, I'm not giving you any letter. I don't have to give you any letter. So what did you say? Of course you do. That's customer service. You want something important, so you send me a letter, and I put it in my files. If you're not going to give me the letter, then what are we left to think? That you're just lying and trying to cover up the truth. And that's not right. That's not cool. And me, me, I didn't break the law. All I did is play a joke on my bank. They haven't gotten it yet. 
I'm beginning to think maybe they never will. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to do, I think. I think I'm going to call that security officer up, and this time I'm going to reach him in person, and I am going to deliver the ultimate ultimatum to that guy. Either give me the letter or never see this money again. No, I'm not going to make that call. <laughs> Okay, you know, here's what undermines my confidence in making that call, because honestly, I'm terrified. Okay, so I start telling my friends that that's the plan, and they're all like, no, 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 don't play hardball with a bank, Patrick. I, I walk into my brother's front room, and they're all talking about me, his wife, my mother, and my brother speaks for the group. He's like, oh, we were just talking about you. You know what, Patrick, just give the money back. Forget about a letter you'll never get. And even if this money is legally yours, Patrick, uh, the law comes down to who has more money. It really does. And we just voted that that's the bank. <laughs> and then my brother goes, plus, you could get a criminal record from this little brother, and it would make it very hard for you to get jobs the rest of your life, especially at banks. <laughs> that's my brother. But my deepest fear is I'll call and I'll talk tough to that guy and give him an ultimatum. But what if he just says, see you in jail, punk, and hangs up the phone? I, I, I don't want to go to jail for this. But on the other hand, there's the principle of the matter. Do you agree? Who agrees? Oh, good. Will you come make the phone call? <laughs> That's what I thought. So... At the, almost the end of my wasting the entire vacation at my brother's house, I decide that I'm going to make the call and stand up for the, myself on principle. And I go into my brother's kitchen where there's a phone, and I hope that I can make the phone call alone. But my mother <coughs> follows me in saying the rosary. <laughs> I pick up the phone, right? And I'm so scared of this phone call that I intend to call him at 8 a.m. But it takes me until 11 to build up the courage to make this call. But at 11 p.m., I pick up the telephone. <laughs> Totally true. And I reach him. Mr. Persons, no, sir, I'm, I'm still in Boston. Listen, I'm going to do all the talking on this phone call. Should you try to interrupt me, sir, I'm going to just keep talking. And I think you're going to want to hear what I'm going to say. And you're probably going to want to take notes on it. I'm only going to say this once. I understand now that this money is legally mine. Oh, yes, it is. Okay, three different ways. Check this out. Non-negotiable on that check didn't matter. What I put in was real. Secondly, cashier's check for the exact same amount of money. Look that up. That's called finality of payment. And thirdly, probably most importantly, the bank missed its midnight deadline, not by a day or two, but by 16 days, my man. Oh, hey, if you happen to know who at the bank faxed me the proof on that one, would you please tell them I appreciate them so much? <laughs> so this is how, this is how it's going to be. The bank is either going to give me that letter where they admit they made a mistake or the bank is never going to see this money again, my friend. Have I made myself clear? I like you. Perhaps we got off on the wrong foot. Oh, no, Mr. Persons. We felt the love in the first phone call, didn't we? You will? Oh, yeah, that's all I want. Oh, my God, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. No, 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 please don't mail it to Boston. Mail it to San Francisco, my friend, because I'm going home. I'm home, right? And I've been only been home for one day when... Ha! There it is! Ha! One million dollars in clothes! <laughs> only in America! I'm just gonna save this for a rainy day right there, ma'am. I love this country.
That's from uh, the bank. So here we go. Wish me luck. Really, wish me luck. <laughs> Thank you. Why don't we read this just one sentence at a time? Dear Mr. Combs, as one of our best customers, <laughs> money talks, doesn't it? So now I'm a best customer. We would like to thank you for banking at First Interstate, and we sincerely appreciate the opportunity to serve you. In order to express our appreciation, we have arranged to give me $1,000, $1,000, holy smokes, of accidental death and And dismemberment? <laughs> you look like a man of experience. Which member do they cut off first? <laughs> Just point to it. I don't think so. Now, I can be afraid of that, but it's their slogan that really scares me. I hope that this is ill-timed junk mail, and I go back for waiting for what will hopefully be a real letter of resolve from my bank. No letter. No facts. No phone call. They don't even send me flowers. The silent treatment is terrifying. <laughs> oh no, seriously, it is much worse than being yelled at. Your imagination goes to the darkest scenarios. What has this bank been doing for the last month and a week? Amassing a giant legal case against me, probably with a team of like 12 on staff lawyers to put me away for a long time over this. Or it's like my mother said, they're going to kill me. <laughs> I'm so glad you can laugh about it. I'm scared. I'm seriously scared. This is $100,000. I'm scared I'm going to be beaten and left for some dead in, el in some alleyway. I'm beginning to think that I need to try and draw some public attention to myself. I wonder if I could get a newspaper interested in my story. Do you think of, if I could that the bank would behave nicer? That they, they wouldn't want a headline, right? Like, bank kills, nice customer. <laughs> so that's what I set out to do, to interest a newspaper in my story. Now, I will admit to you that I called a newspaper that I've never read before, but that I heard was credible. I called the Wall Street Journal. I will super admit to you that I didn't even know it was a financial newspaper. 
But when I called the Wall Street Journal, the reporter answered her telephone. I told her the entire story that I just told you. Yes, it took that long. And at the end of it, she goes, I love this story, but you have to promise me that this is all true. You're talking to the Wall Street Journal now, son. And I gave her the exact same promise I gave you. I said, every single thing that I told you is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So she goes, then this is my story. Do not give this story to the New York Times. And I'm like, the New York Times will take my story? <laughs> But seriously, I decide the Wall Street Journal is good enough for me. So check this out. Me and my friends, I tell them all, we all go out, we buy the Wall Street Journal the next day. I open up the Wall Street Journal and my story is not in the Wall Street Journal. No. I call the woman. That's okay. She says, oh, oh, just buy the next paper. And so I do. I buy the next paper. We all buy the next paper. And I'm not in the Wall Street Journal again and again and again and again and again and again. Three weeks of every day being told to buy it, and I'm not in it. And then finally, Scott goes, do you think this is the journal's way of getting us all to subscribe? <laughs> I am so desperate. I'm so desperate that I do something. I write this story out in enormous detail. It takes me three days and four nights, and then when I'm finally done, I do something I've never done before in my life. I turn it into a web page. HTML, I'm learning. And then when I'm done, I go two blocks down because get this. Right there lives Justin Hall. He's 19 years old. He looks like Legolas from Lord of the Rings. He's here on summer from Swarthmore, and he happens to have the most popular personal website in the entire world. So I go down and I pitch to Legolas, and he says, he will link to my story. And when he does, I wake up the next morning to, you've got mail, 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 and it's pouring in from all over the world every single second, and everybody has an opinion. Oh, yeah, you should stick it to the bank, man, and keep this money, because, oh, you notice, anytime we make a mistake, oh, they shaft it to us, don't they? Yeah, with fees. So keep this money for yourself, man. And if you're not going to keep it for yourself, um, hey, here's my address. <laughs> God, I hope you don't turn the remote to return the money. Please don't return the money. But I thought of a plan if you return the money. Return it in pennies via a dump truck. <laughs> and then this last guy, huh, I like what he does. He doesn't send any words at all. He just puts an attachment on it. <laughs> yes! Love that guy. Love that guy. That is so awesome. Holy smokes. Next day, he's got another thing. What do you got, you son of a bitch? Don't laugh at that. That's not funny. That's very funny, isn't it? It's very funny. As a matter of fact, the, um, the internet is very funny, right? The internet is still a totally anonymous medium. You can be anybody you want to be. You can make anything up. Well, every day in the middle of these hundreds of emails pouring in from around the world, I get emails that are just so ridiculous that I save them all and I put them in a folder called smoking dope, right? And I brought out a couple, yeah, here's a couple of examples of people that are smoking dope while they write to me. Uh, here's one. I'm a lawyer, and you're an idiot. <laughs> Do lawyers talk like that? <laughs> Trust me, you'll be going to jail for a long time on this. I've put people in jail for exactly what you've done. Now, this, this email actually scares all of my friends into saying, no, no, no. I don't even want to talk to you about it anymore. You're on your own. But there, it doesn't scare me because I know that that is one of your children in their bedroom, unsupervised, just f***ing with Patrick. <laughs> and doing dope. Okay, no, here's one. Here's one. Here's a smoking dope one. <laughs> You're holding up a major bank merger that can't go through until the bank gets this egg off of their face from a supporter on the inside who must remain anonymous. <laughs> oh, okay, here's one. 
Now, I don't really know what this guy looks like, but when I get an email from him and I read it, I picture that he's very much a hippie, right? Um, okay, how do I describe this guy in my imagination? Um, I think that uh, he wears a tie-dye t-shirt. I think that he has long hair all the way down to his butt. I think he has a Bob Marley poster right here. And I think he's got some marijuana very close by. Because, listen to what he writes. Hey, bro. <laughs> My name is Wally. And I'm a teller at First Interstate Bank. <laughs> Just across the Golden Gate Bridge from you, man. And today, we got handed a top secret highly confidential memo about you and your check. <laughs> so I'm gonna mail it to you. Anyway, bro, I'll tell you what it says in advance. It says two things. First of all, we are to keep our mouths shut about this situation. <laughs> we are not even allowed to talk amongst ourselves about you in the break room. Zip is the lip. Secondly, bro, we're not allowed to accept any more of these checks. <laughs> now check it out. Two days later, I opened my mailbox, and what do I find? Wally mailed me this. Bank security department, warning, for internal use only, non-negotiable instruments. And then Wally puts a cover letter on it. Bam. <laughs> May I read it to you? Hey, Patrick, it should make a lovely souvenir. Viva la revolution. <laughs> Wally. But wait, he's not done yet. PPS. <laughs> Wally, everybody, give it up for Wally. It's 1.15 in the morning on Hyde Street in San Francisco. It's been my nightly routine for three weeks because I figured out this is where the first drop off of the Wall Street Journal is in the entire city. <laughs> I've paid this paper company so much money I put in another 75 cents to extract more disappointment. Yeah, I'm not in the Wall Street Journal. I'm. Oh my God, I'm on the Wall Street Journal. I'm on the front cover of the Wall Street Journal. It says, prankster exploits a bank's gaff and turns trash into quick cash. <laughs> Woo! And what I do with this little newspaper article is I go to my friend's house, I wake him up, we celebrate the article. I go to another friend's house, wake him up, celebrate the article, and I do this all night long until it lands me back in my apartment at 6 a.m. and yet by 6 a.m. on my answering machine already, first message. Yo, I'm sitting at my breakfast table reading the newspaper. I'm laughing my ass off. <laughs> Keep the money. <laughs> Click. I will never learn that guy's name. I have no idea who he is. I have no idea how he got my phone number. And I have no idea how he called first because the next phone call came in from the producer of the David Letterman show, followed by the producer of the Jay Leno show, followed by Good Morning America, 
followed by a Hollywood movie producer. Uh, I just read your uh, story in the Wall Street Journal and I, I just wanted to call to tell you I'm going to keep my eye on this could be an excellent movie, son, an excellent movie. And I don't want you worrying about how it ends because, listen, if you keep this money in the end, that's a sensational ending. But if you give it back, that's a feel-good story. If you go to jail, well, that's good for us because we don't have to pay for the rights to it. And the last phone call comes in from the Associated Press. The Associated Press calls me up, does a telephone interview with me later that day. And the next morning, their longer story goes out on the international newswire and lands my story in hundreds of newspapers around planet Earth. And it was actually the San Jose Mercury that is the one that carried the headline, Man One, Bank Zero. <laughs> And then it exploded into the news. Patrick Combs. Patrick Combs. Patrick Combs. Patrick is the gentleman that I told you about. Well, it, it came in the mail, but this time it struck me that it would be funny to put it in the bank. And nobody at the bank was amused. The bank honored the check. It was everybody's fantasy. Boom. Wake up one morning and you're $100,000 richer. Patrick says he wants to give the money back. Who gets to keep the cash? that it was ridiculous. It was like monopoly money. It said non-negotiable, and I didn't sign the back. This is David and Goliath. It's the small guy hitting the giant. Banks have forgotten that we're customers and that we want to be treated like people. This is my message to the president of First Interstate Bank. I would like to meet with you over lunch. I'm a fair, decent, honest human being, and I want to work this out with you. Don't count on that lunch, Pat. Seriously, my friends, it is like being in the eye of a media hurricane for three weeks. I'm on seemingly every radio, television, program, newspaper in America, nonstop. And shortly after, in one single day, uh, 140 million people heard the story because I appeared on ABC Nightly News, NBC Nightly News, and Good Morning America, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. Right after that, I get a telephone call from the number one show in America at the time, which was completely tabloid trash news, a show called Hard Copy. Did any of you remember Hard Copy? Yeah, so this trashy show calls me up and listen to how that call goes. We would love to do a feature story on you. Apparently, you don't know that I was just on with Diane Sawyer. Uh, I'm not going to do your trashy television show, bro. I am above it. Well, you don't have to apologize because we hear that all the time. <laughs> but it's too bad because we're the only ones that pay $5,000. Get over here. I'm a media whore. And I did. I sold out for $5,000. And I loved every single minute of it. I did. I did, man. And here's the crazy part. I, Hard copy actually turned out to be my favorite treatment of any of the media in the world for uh, three reasons. Number one, the only news agency in the world that would report any of those laws that were in my favor. Secondly, all of their news rhymes. <laughs> you know what it was? It was, he turned yucks into bucks. It was a Godzilla-sized goof up. Back to you, Jan. And then the third reason why I loved hard copy is at the end of my segment, they set up this telephone number where you could phone in and you could vote on what I should do with the money for only $1. 50,176 people phoned in that night, paid a dollar to say, keep the money, man. It's legally yours. Stick it to the bank. However, 1,814 people paid a dollar, phoned in, and said, shame on you. 
This is not really your money. You should be ashamed and give that money back. And truth be told, factually speaking, 313 people paid a dollar, phoned in, and said, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you should do with the money. But uh, I will, um, dang it. I will, uh, uh, I will, um, I'm gonna call back and try and decide. <laughs> Option. Why are you calling this vendor? It's not on option. Who do you think that is? The IRS. The IRS. <laughs> Who? The IRS. Yeah. the IRS. You guys are negative, man. Okay, apparently I have not done a good job in communicating my situation. That is going to be Oprah. <laughs> oh, you don't believe me, huh? I'm telling you, they don't even call. They literally line up outside the door. Sometimes there are three, and I go out and I do interviews. That's how it goes. They come in and they trade. So I go to do my interview with Oprah. And I open the door, and it's not her. It's a young guy, and he's dressed just in jeans, and he's got a T-shirt on, he's got a backpack. Hey, man. Um, oh, it's strange to see you in person, because you're on, like, every channel I flip to. Uh, Patrick Combs, Patrick Combs in the flesh. Hey, um, I don't know if you know this, but you are a hero all over this city. No, 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 you are. You are a hero to me and all of my friends. We are rooting for you to keep this money for all of us and stick it to the bank, man. And, you know, we all have to make a living, right? I'm sorry, but Patrick Combs... You've also just been served. Good luck. Truly my worst case scenario. Made worse by something that I kept from you. I didn't just get one email from a lawyer saying I was an idiot. I got emails about every day from different lawyers. Some would say that I had committed criminal mischief. Some would say larceny. Some would say fraud. Some even said that I had committed bank robbery and that I would be going to jail for over 10 years for it. Great. I'm going to be the first person in history to have robbed a bank with a smiley face. <laughs> I have to face the music alone. I'm afraid of those words in these documents. Summons. Defendant Patrick Holmes. Case number. First Interstate Bank, Superior Court of California, complaint for money. No bad words on that page. <laughs> or that page. There's no bad words in these documents. You know what Owen Persons, the author of that book, had said? He had said, if the bank tries something, it will be a desperate plea that will look exactly like this, thus proving this bank has legally nothing to stand on in me whatsoever. Oh my God, these documents that scared me so much for so long ended up making me laugh because it turns out on every single page, they have to use their legal initials, which for First Interstate of California, unfortunately turn out to be fecal. <laughs> it's my fecal matter, sir. <laughs> okay, so, um, the trail, we pick up a new trail though. See there it says Bernard Myers, ESQ, First Interstate Bank Legal Services Group, and a phone number. So here's maybe somebody better to talk to. So I dial up Mr. Myers. 
Hi, is Mr. Myers there? Patrick Combs calling? He's not in. No, tell him Patrick Combs is calling. Yeah, I thought he was in. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Myers, hi. Patrick Combs calling? Um, sir, you know what? I'm just going to cut to the chase on this and skip the, f the niceties. You know what? It's game over for the bank. This has gone on long enough. The bank does need to give me that letter now because this money is legally mine, so send me the letter. Patrick Combs, what a pleasant surprise to hear from you right now when we were just taking a meeting about you in the conference room, son. And no, we've decided that we're not going to give you any letter because we're content to just see you in court, son. Mr. Myers, you don't want to just see me in court because in... Mr. Myers, please, again, it's Patrick Holmes calling. Okay, Mr. Myers, you know what? Here's the thing. I think you misunderstand something. I will use every single penny of that $95,000 to fight this in court, to prove that I'm legally right, and it will be a major public embarrassment for First Interstate Bank. Do you understand that? Patrick Combs. <laughs> what a pleasant surprise to hear from you again so soon. I know that you believe you're legally right, son, but how do I explain this to you in a way that you'll understand? You're dead wrong. You're dead wrong about the laws. How do I know you're dead wrong? Because sitting on my desk is the only book that matters in banking law. It's called Brady on Bank Checks by Richard Hagedorn and my friend, Henry Bailey, I'm so glad you brought up that book. <laughs> now, here's the thing, sir. You might find this interesting because my friend Henry Bailey and my lawyer Henry Bailey believes that I have you by the balls to quote him. So let me ask you, do you want to phone him up and tell him he's wrong uh, or do you want to just meet him in court and make that assertion? Perhaps we got off on the wrong foot. <laughs> Mr. Combs, I don't see why we can't get you that letter. Why don't you come to my office a week from now on Wednesday and bring that cashier's check and I'll draw up that letter for you. Game on, sir. So one week later on Wednesday morning, here's my plan. I'm going to stop off at the downtown branch. I'm going to retrieve my cashier's check. And then I've got to walk a couple blocks down to Mr. Meyer's office and see if he's got an adequate letter for me. Now, when I get downtown here, I walk up to a teller. And this teller is in the best mood ever. He's just like beaming sunshine all over the establishment. You know, he's like, hi, how may I help you today? Uh, I'd like to access my safe deposit box, please. Excellent. I would nothing more than to do that for you, sir. What is your name? My name is Patrick Combs. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, my, bank, my name now scares bank tellers that have never met me before. He goes running off over to the branch manager who picks up the phone, starts staring at me, places the four, sh shortest phone call I've ever seen in my life. And then she comes walking back over to me. All right, Mr. Combs, we'll access your safe deposit box in just a minute. Oh, good. Why don't uh, we go now? Because I'm here and you're here. Because we're waiting for somebody. We're waiting for somebody. Now, who in the world could we possibly be waiting? In through the doors of the bank, I swear to you, headed for me are two of the biggest, thickest, no-neckest men you've ever seen in your life. Think mercenaries who used to kill people in Nicaragua with their bare hands. These muscle-bound guys are both dressed in all black suits. They're wearing dark sunglasses, which they do not take off. They have wires coming out of their ear, disappearing into their collar, and they are talking into their sleeve. And one of them parks himself right here, not saying a word, breathing down my neck. And the other one right here, covering something that he's got holstered under his arm. And I'm terrified. Who are these, um, who are these guys? 
they're from risk management. Does that come with free checking? <laughs> so then we go into the vault. Now, when I say we, I mean it because apparently we're a family now that doesn't separate. <laughs> when we get in the vault, I haven't been in here in months and it's just hundreds of boxes and I have no idea what box mine is. Oh God, I have the best bank in the world. Talk about customer service. They marked my box with a big red X. <laughs> So I could easily find it. So I open the drawer and I slide it out and I lift open the lid and I extract the precious $95,093.35 payable to Patrick Combs. And you'll be handing that over to me now, Mr. Combs. Oh, no, no, ma'am. Nope, nope. Uh, I'm not giving this to anybody except Mr. Myers and not unless he gives me this letter that I've requested. Mr. Myers gave me the strictest instructions that you are to relinquish that item to me here and now or he will not see you. He actually said that? Okay, then you, you, you need to call Mr. Myers and tell him I'm not coming. I'm taking my money home. I will call him and you can wait here while I do. And she exits the vault. I make a split second decision to leave, to stay in the vault. <laughs> I sweat it out for what feels like an eternity with these two thugs and then in she comes and she goes, all right, Mr. Combs, I did speak to Mr. Myers and he did agree that he would accept this money from you personally, so you are free to leave my bank. You just gave me permission to leave your bank? Wow, this just gets better all the time. Thank you so much. And so I leave the bank and I exit out onto California Street. And I'm walking down California Street and I've got a ton of risk protection following six steps behind me, talking into their sleeves. I have never felt so safe before in my life. <laughs> I get to the first interstate skyscraper, right? It's the second tallest building in all of San Francisco. And I get to the elevator and Hans and Franz are willing to let me ride up alone. <laughs> so I get in the elevator and I press the button and I ride up to the 31st floor and the elevator doors open. And standing in front of me when I step out is Mr. Bernard Myers, the senior legal officer for one of the largest banks in the world. He's a barrel chested man. He's wearing slacks, a white shirt and suspenders. And the good news is, he's shorter than I am. <laughs> but he takes one look at me and he basically goes. <laughs> Patrick, did you bring the cashier's check? Hand it over. Oh, no, 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 Mr. Myers. Uh, I can't hand over this cashier's check until you hand over the right letter. I'm not handing over any letter today, Patrick. <laughs> whoa, 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 Oh, you're joking with me? Are you joking with me? Come on, you gotta be joking. That's, that's what I came down here for, you said you would. And you do remember that my lawyer is Henry Bailey, don't you? Yeah, I figured out you're bluffing, Patrick. I looked him up, bet you didn't think I'd do that. He's retired, son. He's been retired for a year. Yeah, and he's retired in Providence, Rhode Island. Have you ever met his wife, Martha? Oh, she is such an awesome person. And you know what? When I walk at this bank, if I don't have the said letter, then I'm supposed to call him and he's gonna initiate legal action against the bank. So let me ask you one more time, Mr. Myers. Are you gonna give me the letter or not? Okay, why not? Here's your letter. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Let's just see what you wrote. I did draw a smiley face. <laughs> I'm glad somebody noticed. Fecal made an error. <laughs> well done, Mr. Myers, well done. And so in light of what you just wrote and handed to me, I do have to ask you for my $5. Well, Mr. Myers takes the $5 out of his own wallet and mumbles something like, if it gets you out of the bank any sooner. But I have to say, oh, well, yes, of course, but you know what? I, I'm closing my bank account today, Mr. Myers, and ironically, I have to write you a check because I'm overdrawn by $17. So I write a check to Fecal. 
to close my, for $17, to close my account after 12 happy years, my friend. And I sign that check and I give it to Mr. Myers. And he finds himself fixating on the top right hand corner. <laughs> you like? You like? He no likey. And then I thank Mr. Myers by saying, here's the cashier's check. After all, it was only a joke. And then I exit the bank alone and I step out onto California Street, a free man. And the first thing I see when I step out is this guy right here. He's homeless. He's got his dog with him. I would guess that it's a pit bull or something. And his sign makes me laugh because it says, please help, my dog needs a sex change. <laughs> Have you been to San Francisco lately? <laughs> oh, your dog. Your dog's so beautiful. What's your dog's name? Harley. Oh, hi, Harley. Ah, oh, I am so sorry you two are homeless. That has got to be really rough being homeless. Um, you know what? I'm going to contribute $5 to Harley's cause. Easy come, easy go. And when the money drops, the homeless guy, it's probably the most embarrassing moment of my life. He looks up at me, I guess at what I'm wearing, and he goes, no, you keep it. You look like you need it more than I do. <laughs> that hurts a little, but you keep that money for Harley's sex change. And no, don't worry about me, bro. No, check it out, bro. There is a lot more money where that came from. <laughs> Viva la revolution. <laughs> So I just kind of pulled the fast one because the show's not over yet. <laughs> I love jerking your chain like that. The show's actually not over yet because you haven't whole, heard the whole story. So you'll have the whole story in about three more minutes. But before we get to that really fun part, um, there's just a, I want to keep you here a little longer for a couple announcements, okay? So I'm trying to raise $95,000 now. <laughs> Seriously, a couple things. Um, I have been touring this show around the world for a number of years, and people always ask me, is it really true? Yes, it's really true. Did it really happen to you? Yes, it really happened to me. Okay. Last but not least, one day I was doing the show, and someone come up to me afterwards, and they go, hey, whatever happened to, and they named one of the people in the story. And I go, God, that's a great question. What did happen to these real life people later. So I went and I did the deep research and I found out. Do you wanna know where they all are now? The whole truth and nothing but the truth, my friends.
for me, what happened next is, two weeks later, I was hired to star on that trashy number one show called Hard Copy. Of course I took the job, because I'm a media whore. <laughs> Now, uh, as I said, a number of years ago, I put together this little show called Man One Bank Zero, and it just took off, and I've been touring it around, and by the grace of God, somewhere along the line, I made more than $95,000 doing it. But, but, but here's my favorite part of the entire story. I dreamed of it for years. About three years ago, banks began hiring me to come in and tell them this story. And I have a special asking price for them, $9,593.35. Good night, God bless, happy deposits. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. You guys are awesome. Look at the way that I answer the call. Look at the way that I handle the lights. Look at the way that I handle the lights.